chairperson of this uh, symposium, uh, Dr. Joshi, Excellencies, uh, distinguished resource persons, uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is my pleasure to be with you this morning and to learn many things about the gaps that go along the way from agriculture to the households who really prepare food for consumption and then give rise to a healthy life. Uh, Jessica, you have made a good and very intensive, ex extensive presentation and I don't have to um, speak more than that. Maybe I would like to reinforce or uh, reiterate uh, some of them. You very rightly started with the world we are living in, a very unequal world, where uh, somewhere in the world we are burning our calories to reduce our weight and uh, to be fit. Others who are fighting for enhancing our calorie level to be fit and proper. In some parts of the world, we are consuming more, so much, not giving any space or any, anything to live by to our future generation. And perhaps this is uh, the worry that we all are in and we say, feeding the future. It's, it's not only our babies we are talking, we are talking about the whole future, the, the, the long, long generations to come. And SDGs are very right in that they say that we must go on very sustainable production and consumption patterns. And the present day world doesn't uh, seem to be heading that way unless we make additional efforts to really manage our production and consumption. One, another uh, presentation you made was on rice. It's very interesting. Perhaps one of the first or second staple food in the world. We are rice eaters. We eat rice three times a day in South Asia and East Asia. It has become our habit. And perhaps our rice comprises more than 80% of the things we eat. That happens to me. This happened to me this morning when I ate. So this is every day's life. You will be doing same thing after you we have the lunch break. So what was the what's the story on this rice? Why food security revolves around rice? In fact, in Nepal. Our food security problem is a rice security problem, not a food security problem at all. We are insecure by rice. We are not insecure by any kind of food that we can be made available to eat. And second, we don't know how much greenhouse gases we generate while producing rice. That is more fundamental than, than any other things like obesity or, or more carbohydrate than protein. Some scientists have made presentation in some other occasions that perhaps the CH4 we produce, the methane gas we produce in rice fields might be greater than CO2 we produce in other species, in other, other, other modern lives. And now we really have to do something on the production technology of rice. And people say that if you, de if you dehydrate the rice field at some point of the whole cropping period, perhaps you would be able to reduce the methane, we must do that. I think the research must be linked to the farmer's field, which is a serious gap in our countries. We have fantastic research. They remain in the, remain in the laboratories. They remain in the scientific journals. They remain in the officials' desks, ourselves, <laughs> to be very uh, critic. And perhaps we don't reach anything to the farmer's level. So I think uh, this uh, kind of symposium could set some more light on the production we do, the, the major staple crops we produce, because uh, this is fundamental to the whole food security chain. Who produces, we know who produces it, but for what purpose, not sure. In Nepal, more than 90% of the households produce for themselves. They care for others. They also care for themselves. While doing that, they also care for others. That's why the commercialization of agriculture is not much there and there is a merit to that. That doesn't mean that there should be no specialization. Of course, specialization would lose the biodiversity as you made the presentation, but there would be a compromise between raising productivity, enhancing production to ensure food security and also meeting biodiversity and 
making the products healthier. Like the usage of uh, seeds. If you are using genetically modified seeds, I'm not sure about nutrition, but my colleagues often tell me that in some of the foods, you, you don't have much as much nutrients as that used to be in the indigenous seeds. What is this? I think that there's, there should have been some research and you must be uh, covering this topic also. So I'm worried about the seed, the genetically modified seeds and their implication on nutrition. And the pattern we grow food, use of chemical fertilizers, the use of pesticides, and then after you, grow, grow, you, after you have the harvest and the way you preserve your food, the way you store your food, do we protect the nutrient values? Or do we create more hazardous things in that process? I think uh, the latter is uh, more uh, uh, critical because oftentimes uh, from production to uh, the, the processing and then to taking to the kitchen, there are several other interventions that make food more riskier than before, than at the stage of production. So, it's the whole chain, it's the whole value chain from the supply of raw materials to production, to harvesting, to storage and, and, and preserving food items, to preparing. We are very bad in food preparing. South Asians, we cook too much. We cook too much and my, my colleagues say that we lose all the nutrition in that process. Even the cooking utensils, they, they, are, not, they, should be, they are not as scientific as they should be. In open ovens we cook and we lose some of the nutrients. And then obviously when we overcook, that makes a lot of other problems. And even having food security, we don't have nutrition security. That's the fundamental thing I wanted to say. So, having assured food security doesn't necessarily mean that we have assured uh, nutrition security. That might entail some other interventions, including fortifications. I don't know how much we have been successful in food fortification right in the process of production, right in the process, in the, in the stage of processing, or in the in the, in the stage of cooking, or even if your food are not sufficient from nutrition, how you go by other micronutrients, vitamin A, iodine, or other kind of supplementations. We do have a lot of interventions, but do we really make sense when we keep on doing these artificial fortifications for centuries and centuries? Is this the sustainable way? Should not we have some mechanism which keeps built-in built mechanism that we don't need any, any outside uh, supplementation? Our forefathers never had any supplementation and they lived longer than us. There should be some indigenous technology in that. There must be some indigenous knowledge in that. I think we should also try to understand what that was and how we can use that in a more scientific way so that we can sustain those kind of good things. I think we should also think about it. Uh, and East Asia and South Asia is so, so good in Ayurveda and other kind of things which tell us many things about this uh, sustainable consumption. What are we doing as being in the government? Well, uh, my Joint Secretary, he has already made a presentation on how we are moving in this ladder. Uh, right from the formulation of agriculture development strategy, which focuses more on food security and also sustained uh, production of food items, at least to make sure that food availability perspective of food security is there. But then we are also careful about the quality aspect, the distribution aspect, and the affordability aspect. The affordability aspect is critical because the market doesn't do justice to the poor who cannot make food available on, on the prices they can afford. So we have to be very careful that there is a state intervention in, in the pricing of food items. And I think this is a global phenomena also. So we are trying to enhance our state capacity to supply food items, to store, and also to set minimum prices. And oftentimes, uh, we, um, uh, minimum prices for producers uh, and monitoring of the market price for produced agricultural goods. This is our strategy. We are also uh, having a lot of programs in terms of uh, social sector interventions in nutrition, uh, day meal at school, 
uh, the thousand golden days uh, health programs and the um, reproductive age and the adolescent health uh, education programs, nutrition programs, nutrition education, and the child grant. Child grant is a kind of scheme that uh, helps the parents of the children to buy nutritious food to their children. Uh, it's a small money to begin with, uh, 200 rupees per ch child, uh, up to two ch children uh, of a family. We are trying to universalize it so that at least from the uh, income perspective, uh, parents uh, can fit something to their children from the uh, child grant that we have provided so far. Uh, and oftentimes the, in a joint family like ours, even the old age benefits help a lot to feed their grandchildren. This is also a good thing. And some studies show that the grandparents have spent their old age benefit allowances to feed their grandchildren. So sometimes it also helps in an indirect way. We have been talking about prosperity now with the promulgation of the constitution. And that prosperity is well-being well-being by all perspective, including from human development perspective. That definitely includes a healthy and qualified uh, life of quality, long and healthy life, and educated life. And for that, we need to do many, many interventions in the area of health and education also, along with in agriculture. Uh, we, are in a, we are a country in a, in a big demographic transition. And we say that we must reap the benefit of this uh, demographic dividend. But uh, the people who enter in the labor market, if they are not fit for work or if they are not educated, uh, also because of their illness and some other problems, maybe we don't get the benefit that we should be getting from this uh, growing youth population which enters the labor market in a larger number for some decades to come. So for that also we need to take care of our children so that they become healthier. When they enter the labor market, they enter as a healthy labor force, workforce, and also they are educated. This is more important to us. Uh, we also need to see that the kind of social security spending we are making on people has to be made sustainable for that. You cannot always uh, do health insurance coverage or kind of uh, uh, coverage for your uh, illnesses. Perhaps we should do something to prevent morbidity. So in, in preventing morbidity, perhaps the kind of slides you are showing on these non-communicable diseases, which is so important to us, the, 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 uh, the nature of morbidity is changing from communicable to non-communicable diseases. And here we have to make our interventions and the food habit, food quality, and many other things would matter a lot in this. So I think uh, it is here that we should be focusing also more on the morbidity side of the whole story. And uh, our efforts are towards this. And our coming three-year plan uh, is already uh, addressing uh, these kind of issues in our uh, health and nutrition and agricultural strategies. We do believe that the state has a major role in ensuring public health, protecting biodiversity and environment, and leaving a green wall to the future. Market would try to play around these uh, incentives and other kind of spaces provided by the government to do business. But we should also be urging the market to do uh, ethical business because Public health is our common concern. No market player can have a play to our life and our, to the life of our future generation. So there must be a mechanism whereby we regulate the market for public uh, interest, for public health purpose, and for the uh, for protection, protection of our future generations, including our environment. So how we can work with the market is fundamental. How we can mobilize the communities for the same is equally important, because community organizations have a big say in this, maybe in terms of mobilizing community resources, maybe in terms of uh, better creating awareness on was as you were mentioning. And there are several other things that the, our communities are best suited to do that. We already have practices of cooperative organizations which do social business and which have a large network 
uh, covering uh, nearly half of the country's population, and they can be instrumental to carry not only awareness programs, but also to do socially responsible business so that we can also achieve food security along with uh, nutrition uh, security. The fundamental role, again, is comes to the family. And our food security problems, our nutrition problems are we can see these problems by different dimensions. We, of course, have a special dimension. In remote areas, in areas which are underdeveloped, we do have more, more acute uh, kind of nutrition problems. But it's not related to any geographical area. It is related to so many other factors like uh, the seasonality of food production. And we have seasonal nutrition prog problems because uh, uh, we, we produce crops twice a year, mostly, and sometimes uh, in some places only once in a year. And when there are gaps between harvesting of one crop to another, oftentimes there is a food security problem. And this is where the uh, World Food Program is helping us to do food for work and other programs. That is fundamental. But uh, we should understand that this, this special problem could be better resolved with better infrastructure and better distribution of food items. Uh, the seasonal uh, issues could also be addressed with the same kind of uh, interventions. The gender discrimination on food and nutrition uh, is a kind of social evil, I would say. Uh, and that is critical because um, look at the um, nutrition status of boys and girls in the same family within the, within the same income level. Boys are better off than girls. Uh, lactating or uh, uh, reproductive age women is uh, having uh, malnutrition problem than others. So it has a gender dimension. And we have to look into it, how we can better address this problem. Because the family is totally a family matter. A state cannot even reach there. It can only have some campaigns, some awareness programs, and can mobilize society for the same. And it is where the role of society and non-governmental organizations should be critical. So I would say that if you have to change the family, you have to change the behaviors. Uh, from uh, cooking to, to processing to uh, um, uh, caring about their children and so many things. So it is where uh, I say uh, we have to make uh, additional uh, interventions. There are also social dimensions to nutritional gaps. So we have to see that there are um, some ethnic communities are worse off than others in terms of uh, nutritional status. And it's also a life cycle issue. At some particular age, why, people, why children are more malnourished? Why? In certain age, why it happens so? Is it our feeding process? Is it our caring process? Is it our process of having more children in a, in a shorter gap? What is this? We have to see why this happens. Even in a richer family, who, who can afford their children? Why malnutrition happens in a particular age? That is fundamental, and I think we should take care of this uh, as a, as a uh, life cycle uh, issue of uh, addressing malnutrition. Uh, and then uh, the whole food habit, which is critical. Uh, the rice eaters must understand that we are not eating a very properly balanced diet. Uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, something we need to pursue further to educate our people that there are many things to, to balance our diet. And finally, uh, the challenges that we have, and uh, perhaps uh, the out outcome of the symposium, which helps us to address those challenges, uh, I would like to mention a couple of them. How to link research and evidence to our policies and interventions. As I said in the beginning, good research, good evidence, never linked to policies and our implementation plan. So, uh, we are here with, uh, um, to hear very loudly what we need to do to see that research are really implemented and government becomes the uh, major responsible agency to take them forward and implement them in uh, practice. So this could be one challenge and we'll be happy to see that the implementable programs uh, are discussed here and uh, NPC would be happy to uh, take along these uh, recommendations for its uh, programming and, and uh, implementation aspects. 
the second is coordination among different stakeholders. I was looking at the curve wave kind of thing. So many, so many stakeholders are there. So how to coordinate between many uh, stakeholders, including the ministries of the government and the external development partners. So much so that oftentimes we don't even have the capacity to coordinate the uh, data collection and survey kind of things. Some development partners say, okay, DHS is our flagship program, others say MIX is our flagship program. In between there was BCHIME also. Some agencies say this is our program. Every agency taking the survey as the flagship agenda uh, and the government just uh, taking all of them, uh, oftentimes repeating the process and wasting the resources. So we need to be having one window in monitoring all these things, coordinating things, and see that reporting is from a one-door approach. And the mechanism for reporting that involves a collection of data and information, that should also be done from one window. And uh, I think an NPC should be made uh, formally responsible for that. And we do have the Central Bureau of Statistics where we can produce the relevant data, uh, including for the SDGs, which are so critical for us, so that we can monitor the nutrition, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the, the frequency of surveys uh, could be made more uh, regular and perhaps the quality of surveys could be strengthened so that our monitoring becomes credible and we can have feedback to our policy making process uh, with, with uh, uh, better uh, coordination mechanism uh, at the level of the apex body. So I think these are some of the things uh, that we must do. And finally, I should not forget that how to manage the socks, because nutrition oftentimes comes from different kind of socks, the, the malnutrition issue. Like the kind of uh, disaster we had last year, the earthquake. In the, in the areas affected by earthquake, we had a lot of uh, nutrition deficiency problem because of also the food security and also uh, some, uh, with some other problems. So how to manage those, those, those kind of natural shocks? This is fundamental. And second, how to manage the market shocks like the food, food crisis that we faced during 2007 and 8. How do we cope so those kind of uh, shocks also coming from the external side uh, and then uh, oftentimes, the shocks coming from kind of diseases, communicable diseases, epidemics, whatever. How do we address them? So I think with all these kind of uh, shocks properly addressed, we'll be able to not only protect the kind of uh, nutritional achievements made so far, but also pursue our better lives in future days to come. I do hope that with uh, the symposium proceedings uh, being made by scientists and researchers, we'll be able to get uh, important and very uh, critical components for our policy making process, which I assure would be uh, built into our planning and implementation process. With this, uh, uh, I uh, let me once again thank you all for inviting me to to share some of my thoughts in it, and I wish a great success of this symposium. Thank you.